Well, I'm going to talk about a hidden symmetry, which I hope will be exposed fully when I've finished talking. And what I'm going to say is that nature goes for simple options and it always goes for the simplest. But if you look at physics, it's nothing like simple. What we've got is quantum mechanics, general relativity, two competing theories. They seem to contradict each other and neither is simple. We've also got this fantastically, brilliantly successful mo standard model of particle physics, which has been in place since the 1970s and hasn't changed since then. And we've still not go, got any fundamental explanation, though, though we've got billions of experimental results supporting it. So how do we get out of this chaotic mess into something that might be what nature is doing? This is the current state of affairs. We got four interactions, primary forces, 12 states of matter and 12 anti-states, that's the fermions. The bosons are really not primary. Numerous measurement parameters, space, time, mass, angular momentum, all that kind of thing. And a lot of arbitrary seeming laws which connect them. So the universe seems to be inexplicable intrinsically, though we've got all this stuff to help us to understand aspects of it. So how are we going to make, make sense of that? Well, first of all, we're not going to imagine something even more complicated than we got. It's got to be simpler. So we don't want turtles all the way down. So we don't want to build assumption on assumption on assumption according to the old story. And we don't want a just so story. It's quite easy just to come up with a just so story. Well, that's not what it must be. That's no good at all. It's got to be from something more fundamental. This is more like what we want, a Rosetta Stone. To discover, decipher the hieroglyphics of physics. So perhaps there's a hidden structure which will show where we get all the apparent complications from, something much, much simpler. So what we tend to do quite often is treat our highly sophisticated, high level theories as the fundamental language. And that's not good enough. What we need is something much more elementary, elemental. And we have to ask the question, if nature is simple, why does it look complex? So what's the trick that nature performs to make the intrinsically simple end up by building complications on complications? Is there any clue that we can lead us back from the complex to the simple? Well, I say there is one, and it's the only one that's ever been found to work. And it's based on the only talent that we've developed along with our ev evolution, pattern recognition. The conjurer's trick, doing it by mirrors, symmetries. Because everywhere in nature, and especially in physics, there are hints that symmetry is the key to deeper understanding. And one of the things about physics symmetries is that they're often broken. They're not in perfect form quite often. Some are, but many aren't. Disguised or hidden in some way. And space and time is a classic one. We, we, we know that we can combine them in relativity but they still remain obstinately different physically. So why is there that broken symmetry between those? It may be that these broken symmetries may well offer the clue because our instincts tell us that nature shouldn't break symmetries at the most fundamental level. They should be perfect. There's no reason why nature should break symmetries in fundamental terms. And Symmetry breaking should be a sign of complexity or emergence. And in my view, break, broken symmetries are often not what people think they are. They're not broken symmetries. They're often merging of more than one symmetry, which compete with each other. And so if we look at broken symmetries, we might get the clues about the original, possibly simpler symmetries from which they emerge. So, the probability is there's some hidden structure which appears to us broken, but it has to be simple. So where do we look? Well, I've been doing this for a very long time, many decades, and I know where I look and it seems to be productive. We go to the simplest level we can imagine. And I say that's the parameters, the things we actually observe or 
construct the universe out of. The only ways we've ever had of actually devising an understanding of the world about us. And I think we've got to go for those ideas which are present at every level of complexity. That's why we think space and time are significant because they're always there all, all at every level, whatever level we choose. On the other hand, solidity isn't fundamental because it tends to disappear at the most fundamental level. And then we can look at concepts like force, acceleration, angular momentum, temperature. These are very important physical concepts, but they're not fundamental because they're composites. We can always express these in a composite way using what we call dimensional analysis. So we have to go for the things that we can't do that with. So which are the simplest, the most elementary? Well, as I mentioned already, space is fundamental. Nobody, physicist, philosopher, or anybody else has ever thought otherwise. And there's something interesting about space. It has this structure, three-dimensional structure. And that's got to be interesting in itself, that fundamental quantity has this structure. Also, time, nobody's ever, well, there are people who think time doesn't exist, but there's something that has to take the place of it, even if, even if it's supposedly non-existent. And then what else is that? Well, if we look at fundamental physics, the only things that happen in the whole of physics are interactions, physical interactions between particles, but we'll say more about that. And there are only four of them. Everything's been reduced to four interactions. And gravity is, is certainly one of them, but there are three others that have, have got a kind of similarity, but also differences. And if people are not familiar with these, then just think about radioactivity. There are three main types of radioactivity, alpha, beta, and gamma. And we think, oh, they're just radioactivity. However, these three main types couldn't be more different from each other if they tried. They're the most different things in the whole of the universe. But they're not alike at all. Because alpha comes from the strong force, the force that holds the protons together in the nucleus, the force that holds the proton itself together from the quarks. The weak force is the destroyer, the one that emits neutrinos and changes the nature of particles, unlike other forces. And the electromagnetic force is very familiar to us, of course, in both electricity and magnetism. So these are a spectacular example of a broken symmetry. These forces are alike in some respects, but strikingly different in others. And why is this? There are only four forces. Why are they so different? Well, the source of gravity, we know, is mass. I know that people say it's energy, but energy and mass mean the same thing at this level that I'm talking about. I don't mean discrete mass. So I'll talk about that in a different context later. So what about the others? Well, there is an idea around which has some traction that these are a kind of broken symmetry which under ideal conditions would be perfect. So let's assume that that's possible. Let's assume the ideal conditions. And I'm going to call the source charge because that's the source of the electromagnetic interaction. And ideally, the other two should look like that. And partially they do, but not totally. So I'm going to call it charge. And this is an, um, a concept I've had for many, many years. And it was very much disliked when I first started talking about it. But now everybody talks about weak and strong charges, just as, as I, I have always done. Now, it, this discovery of a broken symmetry is the clue to find in the hidden structure. So why are they so different when they should be similar? So can we project to what should be there before the symmetry is broken? And I'm not here going to invoke some sort of thing that happened in the past, some big bang mechanism or something. This is a fundamental aspect of physics. It's got to be true all the time. And so, if I want to understand this, I've got to searchingly investigate these four parameters, 
these elementary parameters and look at them. And I'm going to pair them off with each other in different ways. And the first one, these are the four parameters I'm going to investigate. Uh, I'm going to mention at first that mass is regarded as a source of gravitational field, mass energy, not rest mass. And of course, there's no such thing ever observed as rest mass. We never observe a particle at rest. And I'm going to say charge is the generic term for the source of the electric strong and weak interactions. And it behaves like a three-dimensional parameter like space does. And I'm going to say that the perfect symmetry between the electric strong and weak charges is broken at normal energies. But it's believed that under some ideal condition called granulification, all three charge terms will be exactly alike. So let's look at space first of all. Now, it's several people have tried to model the whole of nature on space. Descartes is famous for doing it. Extension only, that was his only property. Um, Einstein, to a certain extent, tried to make everything an aspect of space. And why do we do this? Well, it's because space has a unique property. It's the only parameter that can be measured. We can't actually measure any of the others. Whenever we do any other measurement, we're actually observing a point of moving over a scale or something equivalent, counting oscillations or whatever, something that's to do with space. Now you can measure space with any object whatsoever. All objects create a measurement of space. But if we try to measure time, we've got to produce special conditions in which we get a repetition of the same interval isochronous system in some way and it we don't really measure time we measure the spatial intervals and how many times we do it the same if you'd measure mass if you measure mass on a balance you're really measuring a, a point of moving and of course charge it can only measure that as a force between two charges which involves space again so only space can be measured That's, it's an interesting fact that our whole entertainment industry depends on the fact that space is the only thing we can measure because we simulate all the other things, time and, and things and matter and so on by things in space, like films, holography, sound recording, it's all really spatial. So measurability is not a universal aspect of nature. And I have always believed that nothing is a universal aspect of nature. Nothing whatsoever is. We, we always have to counterbalance anything we claim to represent nature. Because if we make any assumption, what will happen is that we will eventually um, reach the asymptotic level of our own assumptions. We won't find anything really new. That's what will happen. So I'm going to assume that I've done enough iterations to, to believe that this is the start, the starting point. And believe me, I couldn't tell you how many iterations I've done, so many. And that we're going to hope that our sophisticated high level theories will emerge from packages composed of these elements. And that symmetry, this is a very important point, this last one. Symmetry breaking is an aspect of the packing, packaging and not of the fundamental nature of the constituents. And I'm going to say that that means that symmetry breaking is local, whereas the parameters themselves are global. I'll say more about that. So here we start. And this is the first division between the parameters, conserved and non-conserved. Two have the conserved property and two are non-conserved. Let's have a look to see what this means. Well, some of the most fundamental laws, the ones that are least likely to be ever broken are about conservation. Conservation of mass and energy, conservation of charge are fundamental laws and they haven't been broken. On the other hand, non-conservation isn't just the absence of conservation, it's a property, it's a very definite property in its own way. And it is in every way the complete opposite of conservation. I'll give you some examples. 
Non-conserved quantities have no identity. One unit of the quantity is good as any other. We have the translation symmetry of time. One moment in time is the same as any other. We can't tell the difference. The translation symmetry of space, one position in space, one, one uh, piece of space is the same as any other. Rotation symmetry of space, the one direction in space is the same as any other. These are fundamental principles. We can contrast that by example with the conserved quantities because these are, and it's never normally said, but these are translation and rotation asymmetric, asymmetric. Each unit is unique. You can't replace one by another. The translation asymmetry of mass, you don't replace one element by another. The identity of mass. The translation asymmetry of charge. You don't replace one element of charge by another. The rotation asymmetry of charge, now this is a very important one. It means we've got three charges. Let's imagine there are, we represent them on three axes. We cannot rotate those axes. So an electric charge cannot become a strong charge, cannot become a weak charge. Three types of charge do not rotate into each other. They're separately conserved and we have two well-known laws in particle physics, baryon and lepton conservation. The baryon is the only particle which has the strong charge, so it can't decay into another particle which doesn't have it, like a pion or something, or a positron. It can only decay into a particle with a strong charge. And this is why proton decay has never been observed, because that's the lightest baryon and it can't decay into another baryon, and so it can't decay. Lepton conservation, well, baryons and leptons are the only particles with weak charges, but leptons don't have strong charges. So they can't decay into baryons and they can't decay into anything else but other leptons. So that's conservation. Let's go back to non-conservation. We have some physical principles that are clearly non-conservation principles. The gauge invariance, which means that field terms are on chase if we arbitrarily change potential. Now, potential in electricity is what we call voltage. In electricity, that's potential. And there's a similar gravitational potential. Roughly speaking, they're either mass or charge over distance. And what happens is that the mass or charge is the conserved bit and the distance is not conserved. So it's completely arbitrary, you know, which position we, we measure a potential from. It's well known that if you, you measure the gravitational potential it depends on the height above the Earth's surface. But I could um, measure it from the height of a table or I can measure it from the, the height above the Earth's surface. And it still doesn't make any difference which one you put into the equation. It's arbitrary. What does make a difference is the mass and charge concept. And if you're a familiar one from your car battery, it says Earth on it, but it doesn't touch Earth. It, that, that zero potential on the battery, the negative plate, is not at Earth at all. It's connected to the chassis of the car, which is insulated from Earth. So it's not at Earth potential. But it doesn't make any difference that it isn't at Earth potential because that uh, distance doesn't really matter. We only ever measure differences in potentials. We never measure absolute ones. So we can make any arbitrary changes in the coordinates which don't produce changes in the conserved quantities, charge, momentum, angular momentum, energy. And then another aspect of non-conservation, why on earth do we have these terrible things called differential equations? Physics doesn't use ordinary equations normally, it uses differential equations, rates of change of quantities, because we can't get directly at the quantities. And what these are doing, they, these are taking the non-conserved quantities, space and time, and saying the rate of space change with time or the rate of space change with time, and then the rate of that change with time are the fundamental things, not the space and the time. And these ensure that the conserved quantities, mass and charge and things derived from them, energy, momentum and angular momentum, 
remain unchanged while the conserved quantities vary absolute non-conserved quantities the variable ones vary absolutely this means that the non-conserved or variable quantities are expressed in physics equations as differentials dx dt that makes physics very difficult because it's on differential equations that makes it a lot harder than if it wasn't which directly express this variation let's go to the quantum state for the moment and the idea that god plays dice in the quantum state well that doesn't worry me i'm happy if god plays dice because if we accept the logic of defining space and time as non-conserved quantities then we can't fix them and they should be subject to absolute variation on one condition that conservation principles continue to hold so your conserv non-conservation is absolute up to the level where conservation applies. So I'll give you an example. We have a free electron. We can, that free electron is anywhere in space. Suppose we bring it by some means near a proton, then the, the, the electron can have any position it likes with respect to that proton, as long as the conservation principles defining that system still hold. Conservation of angular momentum, conservation of charge, conservation of energy. They've got to hold. So if we bring that system up to another, that's a hydrogen atom, if we bring it up to another hydrogen atom and create a molecule, then we'll create new conservation principles which further restrict the, the positions of the electrons and so on until we build large structures which have so many conservation principles restricting them that, that we don't notice any variation. We make classical measurements. I, I personally am not, you know, I don't really talk about collapse of the wave function because I think it's always there. There's a well-known mathematical theorem, Noether's theorem, after Emmy Noether, that says that to every variation property, variational properties is a conserved quantity. Now you can see that to, to, to me, that says conservation, non-conservation, always go together. And this theorem says that gives some examples, the translation symmetry of time and the conservation of energy are the same thing that can be shown mathematically. The translation symmetry of space and the conservation of momentum are the same thing. And the rotation symmetry of space and the conservation of angular momentum are the same thing. And I'm saying this theorem is a natural consequence of defining conservation and non-conservation properties symmetrically. For one, you get the always get one or the other. And I found it was possible to extend these examples by adding two new ones. Um, we know from relativity that the energy is the same as the mass I'm talking about. So energy is related, conservation of energy and conservation of mass are related. And these are the symmetry of time translation. So if mass is involved in this, then charge must be as well. And so what's left for charge? It must be angular momentum and momentum. And those in red in the middle of the table, those are the ones that I've proposed. Now, if we look at the principle of gauge invariance, we can see that the sum justification for the first one magnitude of charge being the same as momentum space translation non-conservation of space conservation of charge now it's possible but what on earth does this the, the last one mean type of charge it means that according to this principle the fact that you can't check rotate electric to strong to weak is the same as the conservation of angular momentum well I found that really baffling at first, and I asked many mathematicians to help me with it, and none of them came up with anything or even tried to. They just thought this was you know, not important, but I think it's very important, very important indeed. It seems totally bizarre. Why, why is the conservation of angular momentum the same thing as the conservation of the type of charge? And this is what the reason is, which I eventually found out. Angular momentum conservation is three separate conservation laws. Magnitude, direction, and handedness, whether it's left or right according to your system. And 
Those three are pre those precisely involved in the U1, SU3, and SU2 symmetries involved with electric strong and weak charges. And if you like, the conservation laws of magnitude of direction and handedness are really saying that the spherical symmetry of three-dimensional space is preserved by a rotating system. And it doesn't matter what the length of the radius vector is, it doesn't matter what system of action you choose, and it doesn't matter whether we choose to rotate left or right-handed. And these are totally independent considerations. Three conservation laws. Angular momentum is three conservation laws. Hence gyroscopes and stuff like that. So that's the first property. Now the second one is a totally mathematical concept, real and imaginary. By real, I mean squaring to positive values. By imaginary, I mean squaring to negative values, what we call norm one and norm minus one. And we can split them up in this way. Mass and space are real. Time and charge are imaginary. Notice we change the parameters always from the first slide. Now, let's look at space and time. Relativity combines space and time in a four vector with three real parts and one imaginary part, and the imaginary part is time. So if you write Pythagoras theorem in four dimensions, in three dimensions it will be r squared equals x squared plus y squared plus z squared, and it means that it doesn't matter which x, y, z you choose as long as you finally get r as the resultant. If we make it four dimensions, then we add minus c squared t squared, c being the velocity of light. And in most systems, we, we make c1. And so we can write that as x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus i squared, c squared t squared, where i is the normal square root of minus one. And we can write the thing that produces that, the four vector, as, as a three vector terms plus i c t. So clearly, according to relativity, we can represent space as uh, real and time as imaginary. Now let's look at mass and charge. There's an age-old problem of why identical masses attract and identical charges repel. And that's of any interactions, I will say, any, any of the three interactions. So the first equation there is Newton's law of gravitation. And the minus means that the, the force is attractive because it's instead of pushing out as the positive vector does, it pulls back. And, and notice it's minus constant and then m1, m2 over r squared. The second one is the Coulomb law of electric static repulsion between identical charges. And this time you've got a positive value for the force because you're pushing out, you're, you're repelling. Why don't those laws look the same? Well, the reason why they don't look the same is because charge is imaginary. And if you write an imaginary charge in there, you will get the same type of law as you get for Newton's law of gravitation. It looks exactly the same, but you've got IE instead of E. Okay. But we got three charges, electric, strong, and weak. So are they alike? Well, I've already said they are. So there must be some way of having a three-dimensional imaginary quantity. Yes, of course there is. Hamilton discovered it in 1843 with three real part, three imaginary parts and one real part called the Quaternion system. And the amazing thing about this is it's unique. It can only be 3D unless you mess about with the algebra in incredible ways. It can only be 3D. Now Hamilton discovered quaternions when he was trying to extend the complex number system. He there's a well-known representation of complex numbers called the Argandine, where you represent them in a plane, in a, in a pair of axes, real on the horizontal and imaginary on the vertical. He tried to extend that to three dimensions. And in doing so, he realized that he had the first ever and only known explanation for three-dimensionality. So this is what he called his triplets, or think perhaps triads, um, just the real axis horizontal and the one of the, the I, the imaginary axis vertical, and he tried to have another axis J perpendicular to both. And this doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is there's no product for IJ. You can't find anything in the system which it is equivalent to IJ. And so eventually after a lot of struggle, 
he extended the imaginary numbers to three axes, which were rotational, i, j equals k. And you can't any longer show the real dimension with them. You can only show the imaginary ones. So just one small problem. If, and this is what held him up for so long that he was, every time he tried to do it, he found he got anti-commutative quaternions. And it wasn't till he accepted anti-commutativity was essential that he actually made the, his final breakthrough. So these are quaternions, they're all square roots of minus one. And ij e doesn't equal ji equals minus ji, it's anti-commutative, then it equals k. And the same with jk and ki. They rotate, but they're anti-commutative. And it's very easy to show what, how they're anti-commutative. Let's try, well, if, we, if they were commutative, then ij and ji would both equal k. So let's try multiplying aj by ji. Let's multiply the j's first, that's minus one. So let's bring that outside and we got minus i, that's plus one, not minus one. If there were both k, then it would be minus one. So they're anti-commutative. One, one of the products has got to be plus one, uh, sorry, um, one of the products has got to be minus k and the other one k. This is very good because it explains three-dimensionality because you can't extend anti-commutative to work with more than three terms. And there are mathematical theorems done after Hamilton time, which prove that. So anti-commutativity is the same as three-dimensionality. It's the more fundamental idea is anti-commutativity. Now I know you can extend it to seven, but then you've got to be anti-associative, which is a real nightmare if you're trying to explain any physics. And you can't do it beyond seven at all. Now, Hamilton thought the imaginary part was space and the real part was time. And he, he thought he discovered a key to the universe. And lots of people said, what nonsense, absolute nonsense, terrible nonsense. And one of them was E.T. Bell, who wrote a book, Men of Mathematics, around about 1947, and said, never has a great mathematician been proved more hopelessly wrong. Well, in my opinion, it's the mediocre history, historian of science who's hopelessly wrong, not the great mathematician. Hamilton had actually discovered the key to three-dimensionality. Well, what, what more significant discovery could you make? And a great deal more besides. I've got his lectures behind me on, the, on this bookcase. If you multiply the quaternion units, and there's four because it's quaternion, there's four, there's the real part, one i, j, k by ordinary square root of minus one i, they become a four vector with units i for the time variable and then the, four, the vector units i, j, k. Now, I, I, I normally write um, quaternions as bold italics and vectors as bold. And so you, you also anticipate the connection between space and time in relativity as Hamilton did in his writings. He mentioned it quite a number of times. So space and time become a four vector with three real parts and one imaginary by symmetry with the mass and charge quaternion with three imaginary parts and one real. And we know that the, the charge one, the, the, the quaternion cannot be more than three. And as it happens, vectors like quaternions are also anti-commutative, which is why turning a screw thread one way is different to turning it the other. That's because space is anti-commutative as well. And that wasn't realized until then. And so we now have quaternions on the left-hand graph, um, mass charge and vectors, four vectors on the right-hand charge uh, graph. And notice the mass cannot be represented on the quaternion axis and the time cannot be represented on the vector axis. And the, the little diagram below is saying that the quaternions are not rotational whereas the vectors are. And there's a fantastic bonus. If we apply quaternionic multiplication rules to the space vector, we discover things about vectors we never knew before. This is what we call Clifford algebra. And this is what David Heston has uh, very successfully used in physics. And by, by 
Doing this, we automatically incorporate the property of spin. There's nothing mysterious about it. It becomes an obvious consequence. Because we have a full product for these, we used to be taught that there was a vector product, A dot B, and a scalar product, A cross B, and that you had to be done differently and they didn't make any sense. But they do make sense because they don't have to be done separately. They're part of one big structure. Space and time are simply quaternions multiplied by I. And Hamilton was right all along. So are there any other advantages in doing real and imaginary descriptions? Well, yes, there's lots of advantages. When we do physics, we, we realize that quantities in time are not significant in physics. Quantities in time squared are. Acceleration and force drive everything in physics. And there, time squared. It's distance per time per time, or, and mass times distance per time per time. There's double time measurement involved, time uh, parameter involved. And time measurement, or so-called, which is also it's not really time measurement, but even if you do what we call time measurement, always requires force and acceleration. And there's no one way speed of light. We can't measure time by sending a light signal. One way, we can only, we've got to reflect it back. And that always reminds me of Lewis Carroll's white king who had two messengers, one for going and one for coming back. But we can't actually do that. We've got to have the same messenger. So imaginary quantities are also algebraically dual and real ones aren't. It, that means that if you've got positive solutions, you can only have them if you've also got negative ones. So all charges, if they're imaginary of some kind, they have to have solutions for both sides. And this is why we have to have antiparticles or antistates, which don't have to have opposite masses, as we'll explain later. They only have to have opposite charges. And even things that don't have an electric charge, like a neutrino, have an antiparticle, an antineutrino. But things that don't have any charges at all, like the photon, are their own antiparticles. And this is another thing that tell, indicates you know, what's real and what's imaginary. Mass is real, and we can detect it in two different ways. We can do it through inertia. That's just mass, not mass squared. Or we can do it through gravity, which is mass squared. But we can't do charge directly. We can only do that as squared because it's imaginary. We've got to have a force between two charges. If you had one charge in the universe, it would never know it was a charge. It has to have another charge to, to interact with for us to know it's there. So finally, we come to the last division. And this is, this is the one that for years was the most contentious. And it, it meant I had to search for a mathematics I didn't know exist, but it does exist. So this is the divisible and indivisible. And this is where we do a different pairing again, space and charge against mass and time. So I'm saying mass as we were talking about this kind of mass, global mass as I call it, not local mass. Mass energy, it's a continuum, present everywhere. We've got the Higgs field, we know that's there. We've got vacuum, we know that's where the Higgs field is. We've got zero point energy. And some people might say cosmic microwave background radiation and ordinary fields behave in this way as well. And this is precisely why you can have positive mass always and never negative because it cannot be zero. You can't change sign. If if it's continuous, it can't, it can't go through a zero position. It wouldn't be continuous if it did. So there's no zero, no crossover, no, 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 no other axes, nothing like that. However, we always, have always known charge was discrete and delivered in, in chunks, precise units. I'm not talking about the values of charge. That's really energy. I'm talking about the, the, the charge units. So let's go back to space and time for a moment. Why are they fundamentally different? And a bit of philosophy here, and not just mathematically, they're completely different quantities. And time is not part of space, it's something else. Well, time is continuous and space isn't. And this, 
It's the space one that caused me most trouble, and I'll explain why. Time's continuity has many consequences. It means that time is irreversible. So, because if we wanted to reverse time, we'd have to create a zero. We'd have to have a stopping point and come back on itself. It would no longer be continuous. Time is irreversible, precisely for that reason. Nor is time an observable in quantum mechanics. We never actually write time as an observable. Space is an observable, but time is not. And when we do differential equations, we always make it what we call the independent variable. We never write dt over dx, we write dx over dt. Time is the thing that runs on its own, and the thing that we observe is the space. We can't do it the other way around. And this is a favourite old one. This is Zeno's paradox of the Achilles and the tortoise. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, but I'll just run through it quickly. Uh, the tortoise gives, but well, Achilles gives, is 10 times faster than the tortoise. He gives the tortoise 100 meters start. So he starts running the 100 meters and the tortoise goes 10 meters while Achilles goes 100 meters. And then the Achilles has to catch him up there. So he runs the, the, the 10 meters and the tortoise goes one meter. So Achilles has to run the one meter and the tortoise goes a tenth of a meter and so on, and he never catches up. And the various philosophers have talked about this. Um, the, or, or also science writers, Whitra, I think is a philosopher, I met him once. Um, you conclude that the idea of infinite divisible of time must be rejected, or one must recognize there's logical fiction. Motion is impossible if time and correlated space is divisible out of infinitum. And Coveney and Highfield science writers say either one can seek to deny the notion of becoming, in which case time assumes its essentially space-like properties, or one must reject the assumption that time like space is infinitely divisible into ever smaller portions. N neither author and most other people don't actually say that the real that you've got to opt for time being uh, continuous. But there is a reversibility paradox, another paradox, a more recent one. Aren't all normal physical equations time reversible? So they are. And the reason why that is, is because we know uh, we, time is not reversible. We know that from the second law of thermodynamics. And as Eddington said, you can uh, violate any law of physics you want, but if you violate the second law of thermodynamics, the only thing is to put a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the sea. It's, a, it's completely inviolable. You cannot violate the second law of thermodynamics. And we know that time, that means time isn't reversal. We know that if we make a film of us dropping a cup of tea and smashing the cup, that, that we know which way round is forward and which back. And we always do. But physical equations are time reversible mathematically. And that's because time is an imaginary parameter. So it's got equal positive and negative solutions. But physical actions involve time squared. So it doesn't really matter whether it's plus or minus. You can reverse time symmetry, but you can't reverse time because you can change plus and minus. Time itself, the continuum can't be reversed. There's no paradox whatsoever. Now, this is the one that caused me total most problem. After the charges, this caused me the most problem. Space has to be discrete. And of course it's got to be discrete because how can we observe it? But it's discreteness isn't fixed. That's the whole point. It's different from that of charge because it's a non-conserved quantity. So it doesn't have fixed units. It means that it's discreteness must be endlessly reconstructed, which allows us to do fractals. It's infinitely divisible and we can keep dividing it and we can keep recalibrating it any way we want. It's the absolute continuity of time which makes it impossible to divide time. And infinite divisibility and is the absolute opposite of continuity. They're not the same thing at all. They're completely opposite. So this is where I had to find some mathematics I didn't know existed. Space is represented mathematically as a real number line. That's a common way of representing space. 
but real numbers are not necessarily absolutely continuous because there are two systems of algebra, two of geometry and two of calculus. And these depend on two different equally valid definitions of the real numbers. These are called standard and non-standard analysis. Standard's the one we have Cantor sets and all that kind of thing. Non-standard is more recent, 1920s, Skolem Lovenheim theorem and Abraham Robinson produced standard analysis. Interestingly, standard analysis, uh, non-standard analysis, sorry, uh, frequently uses a nilpotent structure. Different from mine, but still a nilpotent structure. And for calculus, there were two ways of differentiating known from the beginning. And these really, these really come down to the differentiation of, with respect to time or space, the two, up the two variable quantities. Only the time one actually solves Zeno. It's been used to say limits solve Zeno. Well, it does, but that's because it's time. The other one is infinitesimals. And now infinitesimals have been re resurrected as a result of non-standard analysis. So it's like the, the, the argument about mathematics. Is it out, out there? Or is it something we construct? Well, it's either. If it's out there, then the real numbers can't be counted. Cantor's argument. If we have to construct it, then they're countable, leading to non-standard analysis. And the same duality in mathematics applies in physics. We combine space and time in a four vector, but we're doing something that we physically cannot do. So we've got to make space time-like, which is the discrete solution, or we make space, sorry, time space-like, which is the discrete solution, or space time-like, which is the continuous. And this is where wave particle duality comes from, and also the, the dis distinction between Heisenberg and Schrodinger's version of quantum mechanics. And this is a key point here. Discrete quantities are always three-dimensional. Continuous quantities are non-dimensional. If you like, you can call it one-dimensional, but there, there isn't any uh, dimensionality, really. So why are continuous quantities dimensional, non-dimensional? Well, we can see that because you can't have an origin. So you can't have a zero, you can't have a crossover point. That would be incompatible with continuity. That's no problem. So, but why discrete quantities three-dimensional? Well, if we look at a quantity with only one D, we couldn't measure it because the crossover point to another dimensions are needed to do, do it, do the scaling. So a line isn't a one-dimensional structure, but a one-dimensional structure that can exist in a two-dimensional world, and even a two-dimensional world doesn't really is. You have to have a three-dimensional world to draw a line. To actually draw it, you've got to have thickness on the page and things like that. But there's a much more direct argument, and this takes us to the deepest foundations of both mathematics and physics. And this difficult to explain connection between discreteness and three dimensionality turns out to be the key to the whole problem of getting something from nothing. This, is, this isn't something I can talk about now, this is something else I can talk about in a future date the, the universal rewrite structure. But I, I, if I only have four parameters and the, the two that are three-dimensional are also discrete, then it follows that discreteness in nature comes from anti-commutativity and not from anything else. Ultimately, the real reason is anti-commutativity allows us to have a dual pairing between i and j and j and i, whose total is zero. And totality zero is something I have always sought in nature. So nature generates something from nothing by producing an infinite or closed, a set of closed quaternion triplets like i, j, k, and these can represent discrete numbers or objects. And that's the rewrite structure. This is my book on zero to infinity. That's the uh, full significances in the first chapter of that. And this is the other key text, Foundations of Physical Law. Both are published by World Scientific. This is based on 10 lectures at the University of Liverpool, which are available video, slides, text, and the various sites. And I've just put one down there for when I send the slides out. Now, putting everything together, from those, all that argument, let's put everything together. And everything goes together in this table. 
see the two non-conserved, two conserved, two real, two imaginary, and they're, and they're different, they're different pairing. And then we get two continuous or commutative, dimensional if you like, and two that are discrete or three-dimensional and anti-commutative. And when we look at this, this strikes us straight away, it's perfectly symmetrical. And this is a symmetry I found many decades ago, and I still haven't found anything that breaks it, as we will see. So this symmetry is a group of order four. It's called a Klein four group. It's the group of the rotations of the rectangle, D2. It's a very simple group, and it's almost the simplest group except the cyclic groups below it, C2 and C3. And you can write it, you can use algebraic symbols to express it simply if I just put algebraic symbols for what I call the properties and the anti-properties. And if you add it all up, it's a conceptual zero, which is what I'm, I've always aimed at. I do not want anything in nature to be characterized. It must always add up to zero. And also you notice the, uh, the four parameter structure is like one, per, one parameter and three sign variations. It's just like the Dirac um, nilpotent wave function. You've got only got one value that's independent. The others follow automatically, like the general. I got the first medal by accident, and the rest followed automatically. So we can assume that this Klein 4 group is absolutely true globally. That's when you treat the parameters as separate from each other. And no exception, I'm going to say, and can stand by that, has ever been found. And this condition can be used to put constraints on physics to derive laws and states of matter. And I have done exactly that. So we can get some nice representations of this, which not only shows the absoluteness of the symmetry, but the idea of three dimensionality being central to the argument. And here I say again, the perfect symmetry between four parameters means that only the properties of one parameter need to be assumed. The rest follow like kaleidoscopic images. And it is in fact arbitrary in principle which we start with. I used to start with space, sometimes I start with mass. And it also suggests that three dimensionality is key to this symmetry. Now this is one, this is what I call the color representation by great good luck, our three color system also matches the three um, properties. And I can make, I can use either of these circles. I could make the left hand, let's look at the left hand one. I could make the central circle, um, whatever you like, let's call it mass. And if I take the, the red at the bottom to be mean real, and if I take the blue to be conserved um, and the green to be dimensional or non-dimensional as, as it happens. So it's non-dimensional for mass. So green is non-dimensional. Blue is, um, is conserved and red is imaginary. Is, sorry, red is real. Real, conserved and non-dimensional. So if I look at the next circle surrounding it, I've now got magenta where there was green. So that property is going to swap over and th that's going to become um, dimensional. Uh, the blue is still there. So that's uh, conserved, dimensional conserved. And the cyan below the red means it's imaginary. So that's clearly charged with those properties. And I can do it for the others. But I could swap them all around, I could change the colors, I could change anything. I could change it to the other diagram using the secondary colors and then the, uh, bringing the prime primary afterwards. So that's the color representation. Sum them all up, you get zero, white. This is another representation, the 3D representation. You put, draw a line from the center of a cube, Let's, it's easier to see this way. And the red lines there are the could be the parameters using those X, Y, Z things. Interestingly, the cyan ones um, suggest there's a dual group and there is a dual group. The dual group is what happens if you switch one of the pro properties around. 
for example, you can switch the real and imaginary properties around and what you get then. Well, what I notice you get then is the properties as they, the parameters as they appear in the Dirac equation, not the pure global ones. And this is another favorite, the tetrahedral. And you can use either vertices or faces to represent the um, parameters. And you can see the three green, blue and red going into the into the top one and that those are the three properties going in and the colors and and uh, the primary and secondary colors are the properties and anti-properties i'm just going to list a few consequences that we have of this group conservation laws and map these are these are the things we've had a look at notice these are obvious consequences immediate consequences and they're only on the symmetry there's no physics gone into this as such it's just purely symmetry of this group. And there's a lot more besides, so I just put some of them down. So another thing you can do when you look at the parameters and the properties is that they're purely abstract. In fact, they can be reduced to pure algebra. Real and imaginary is clearly just algebra. Commutative and anti-commutative is obviously just algebra. The conserved and non-conserved is not so obvious, but I believe that it is just algebra. And I believe what that is, is that the Conserved property have closed quaternion units and the non-conserved have imaginary numbers that are not quaternions, which are um, in Clifford algebra, they become partial um, quaternions. They're unclosed quaternions. So this, there's something incomplete about them. And we could actually start with the algebra to define the three properties we've had. So this is the algebra now representing the properties. Uh, mass is a scalar, time is a pseudo scalar, complex numbers, imaginary numbers, charges a quaternion and space is a vector. And what you may notice is that the first three are simply subalgebras of the last. And if we combine them together, we would get another space-like quantity. And we could write it as the red RJK bold vector. So they're equivalent to another vector space what I call an anti-space, if we want totality zero. And to counter the real space, IJK blue. So we can see why space appears to have a privileged status. It's got more structure than all the others. And that's why that it's useful for observation and the others aren't. And the other space isn't observable because it's not a single quantity. It's a mixture of two or three. So the, all the parameters are equivalent in the group, but they actually produce a mathematical hierarchy, like a kind of evolutionary structure. And I've gone into that in the rewrite structure. We can de derive it from a more gentle, uh, general information process. And I think it operates in mathematics, computer science, chemistry, and biology, as well in more complex aspects of physics, not just in fundamentals. We can actually derive some of that complexity directly. Okay, that's the global situation. What happens when we put it all together into one object, if you like? We package the physical information and we combine all this algebra, all this four parameters together. Well, if we, if we combine all that algebra together, what we get are 64 units, which I'll show you in a moment. And these turn out to be the algebra of the Dirac equation. And this equation is that of the minimum packaged unit in physics, the Fermi or elementary particle. And it, I didn't work this algebra out as anything to do with the Dirac equation, but it, it came afterwards to me that, I, that it really was the Dirac algebra. And so that was a big, another big breakthrough for me. But these are the 64 units. Um, complex numbers times vectors, complex numbers times quaternion, complex numbers times vectors and quaternions. However, this group only requires five generators. So the minimum information is five units. And there are many ways of selecting these, but all of these sets have the same overall structure. I mean, you can do it without using that structure, but then you don't get all the parameters in it. This is, one way of doing it that there are plus and minus versions of this it's 32 on this page but there's plus there's minus versions as well as plus these form another group a group of order 64 
And a simplest starting point for any group could be the generators, the, the set of elements which are sufficient to generate it by multiplication. The minimum description of the group, and I've picked out five on there marked with an asterisk. However, this is another way of setting out the same information. And here I've got the negative ones as well as the positive. And if you look, you can see that the, the table, if you forget the first line, which is just complex numbers, the second line, uh, and you've got positive on one side and negative on the other. Let's just look at the positive. We got five objects there. And if you look at the five objects, they've got all the single components based on the algebra of space, time, mass, and charge, but they're arranged in, um, in that structure. What I want you to look at in particular is all the, all the, these are called pentads and, the, and there are 12 of these and they just repeat themselves. You can fiddle around with the vectors and quaternions, plus and minus, imaginary and non-imaginary, but it doesn't really matter. They all come out the same. And any of those five can be used as the generators of this group, at least if you, if you complexify in some cases. Now, if you look at the top line, you can see there that the three blue units, I, J, K, of space are attached to one quaternion, red I. But you notice that the other two quaternions are attached to other things. The K is attached to a complex I and the J is attached to a unit one. So that's going to change the whole nature of these things by bundling them together. And this is what this compactification is what I believe creates locality. So we start with eight basic units, but by the time we've worked out all the possible combination, we get 64. The most efficient way is to get five composites rather than eight primitives. Nature will always go for the most efficient or the simplest or the least of anything. If we take the properties of the prams independently of each other, they're global. But if we combine them and produce compactified representation, we change the local conditions. So this is what we've done here. We've effectively, to, to get those, that particular um, arrangement of five, we've taken the IJK of charge and put each of those onto different parameters. Okay, and, we, you, and whatever you do, you're gonna break the symmetry of one of the three dimensional quantities because the red ones no longer have rotation symmetry. They're not attached to the same sort of object, whereas the blue ones retain theirs. And what I'm saying is this creates the new compound and quantized physical quantities. Quantized because you've got quantized units doing it, the charge units. You've got energy um, is IK and I, 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 J, I and K, I are momentum and mass is I, J. That's not mass as we had it in the past, that is now rest mass, discrete mass. And those, the E and PX and PY and all that are just scale of values. They're just coefficients. The real physics is in the operators in the middle of the page. That's what tells you it's an energy term or a momentum term or a mass term. And as we've seen on other occasions, well, to some people have, the combined object is nil potent squaring to zero. So if I put the whole thing in a, in a bracket and multiply it by itself, I can get zero because, we, because the squared product gives us Einstein's energy equation. E squared minus P squared minus M squared equals zero. And what the Dirac equation does is quantize the nil potent equation. It, it uses it it replaces the e and p in the first bracket with differentials in space and time however we don't actually need to do that we can treat the first um, the first bracket as operators and we can still write e and p then and the second bracket as the thing as the amplitude term and what we're doing together is bundling everything together in a local system a local system is going to be relativistic and it's going to be quantum. So we can take the first bracket as an operator. This is to get quantum mechanics on the phase factor, the EMP terms, 
And the E and P terms can include any number of potentials or interactions with other particles. It's just a ge generic thing to write E and P, completely generic. It, it's not a scalar value, it's a generic um, operator. But if we take the um, bracket as an amplitude for a particle, then we've got the Pauli exclusion principle because it means two particles can't be the same or their combination would be zero. And if we look at the broken symmetry between the three, the three red objects, we see that we've got a broken symmetry between the charges. And, and these charges are now adopt the characteristics, the mathematical objects they're connected to. So the first one is connected to a pseudo scalar and it, it takes up SU2 symmetry. The second one to a vector and it gets SU3 symmetry. And the third one into a scalar so that retains U1 symmetry. And you can actually do this, go through the, the full technical mathematics of this um, and develop those um, groups, SU2, SU3 and U1 for this structure. Now, if I look at Pauli exclusion, another way of looking at that is to say nature represents the totality of zero. And if you imagine creating a particle with everything it's got in it, potentials, connections, and all that, in that form, then the rest of the universe has to be the opposite. It has to be the negative of that. So we get a total of zero. And it also has to be multiplied to zero as well. So we have to do global and local additions because basically locality is all about multiplication and globality is about addition in principle. The whole left by creating the particle from nothing is what we call, which is the rest of the universe. Once you've, once you've took the particle out of nothing, you're left with the rest of the universe. And that's the universe that's needed to maintain the particle in that state, you give it the name vacuum. So the vacuum for one particle cannot be the vacuum for any other. Now let's just have a little bit of entertainment here. A lot of people think that you've got a 10 dimensional system. Well, you can have it from this if you really want, because each nil potent's got three um, red terms and five red terms and five others. So you've got energy, three components of momentum and rest mass. You've got weak charge, three components of strong charge and electric charge. And all but six of those are fixed and the string theorists like to say that they're curled up. And the first group can also have time, three-dimensional space, and proper time instead of, I won't bother about talking about membranes. So I think we've now reached a position where we can show that the structure of physics is symmetry between space, time, mass, and charge. Packag packaging these into a single structure as a fundamental particle creates quantum mechanics and relativity and breaks the symmetry between three units of charge. And it also maintains zero totality. And I uh, asked my biological colleague to make a better drawing of uh, the diagram I drew, and this is what it looked like. And you can see that's the drawing. Right. So have we got a Rosetta Stone? Well, if it's true, and I think it's been tested to destruction in both global and local forms, we may have our Rosetta Stone. If we want to take it to the next level of application, we assume that the symmetry is absolute, unbreakable and exclusive and that there's no other information. And then you've got a powerful constraint on all possible theories. And uh, I've done that and you can see it in my book, Zero to Infinity and the Foundations of Physical Law. And thank you very much for listening.